Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another virtual museum lecture presented by the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. Our community is filled with diverse stories, and we recognize that our story begins with the indigenous peoples of this land. We acknowledge that we are broadcasting this lecture on lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for millennia, and we would like to honor the centuries of Indigenous peoples who walked on Turtle Island before us. My name is Sarah Nixon, public programmer here at the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center, and I am so, so excited to welcome our esteemed curator, Kathleen Powell, to deliver tonight's lecture titled For King and Country, St. Catharines and the Boer War, 1899 to 1902. Thank you everyone for joining us for the series. We hope this lecture provides you, or these lectures rather, provide you with a bit of historical joy and also a spark imagination and exploration for our city's rich history. A quick reminder for those watching on your mobile devices, please check the audio settings in the YouTube app um, if you're having any trouble with the audio, audio problems, I know we have a slide, I think, that, that shares what your, what the, the, what the, your YouTube looks like, and, and you might not have access to the chat box, um, but you can always post comments or questions in the regular comments below the video. Um, please also feel free to ask questions in the chat box that you see um, in the screen here and on your screen at home. Um, we will definitely be monitoring this chat box and at the end of the presentation, we will get to your questions. But before I hand this off to Kathy, I'd like to remind you all of our exciting lecture lineup that's remaining for the winter. I can't believe how quickly uh, this series is going by. Uh, so next up on March 30th, we are so excited to welcome local geographer and former Brock University map librarian, Pauline Beard, who will talk about the historic Welland Canals mapping project. And then on April 13th, we're very excited to welcome students from the Brock University Historical Society uh, to present a mini symposium of recent undergraduate work. And finally, on April 27th, we will close out this series with a very special guest, um, author and historian at the Canadian War Museum, Dr. Tim Cook who will give a talk about remembering the Second World War and his new book, The Fight for History. And we are already working on a lineup for the fall of 2021. If you have a topic you would like to see presented as part of this series, please, please send us a note. We're always looking for new ideas and new research rabbit holes to go down. Um, you may also be interested um, in an, another upcoming virtual event. We know you like our virtual events and we have uh, one to celebrate the canal opening for the 2021 shipping season. Uh, the Welland Canal, it opens this Friday, March 19th, and we are celebrating with an unofficial event on Facebook Live. You can tune in to our Facebook page at 10.30 a.m. and join our visitor services coordinator, Adrian, as he takes you through our new permanent exhibition, the Welland Canals Gallery. This is a visually striking exhibit that is, you know, many years in the works and we're so excited to finally have it uh, avail ready for, for visitors and for you to see. So definitely tune in to our Facebook Live event um, you can find us on Facebook by searching St. Catherine's Museum, and you can RSVP to this virtual live event. I sincerely, sincerely hope that everyone has been enjoying our virtual museum lecture series, and I'd like to encourage you to make a donation to the museum in support of our programming. Your donations help us to continue to provide the high quality and enjoyable programming you have come to expect from us. And we really appreciate any donation you're able to make. 
uh, give us a call at 905-984-8880 um, or email us um, to make your donation. Your donations really do make a difference. So uh, thank you. And I think that's it for my introductions. So without further ado, I am so happy to welcome Kathleen to this lecture. The stage is yours, Kathy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining uh, me this evening for uh, this lecture uh, called For King and Country. Uh, I should clarify the title just a little bit uh, because the title for King and Country is really based on the the, the late end of the time period of this lecture, 1902, not 1899, uh, when Queen Victoria was still the queen. So uh, it could be for king and country or for queen and country, uh, which you will uh, see if I can get this to work. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my slides to, there we go, for Queen and Country. Uh, and I'm gonna talk tonight about St. Catharines and the Boer War. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, conflict in my opinion, and one that hasn't been studied uh, as much uh, for St. Catharines locally as uh, some of the other military uh, conflicts that, um, some of the other conflicts that our military establishment locally have participated in. Uh, before I start my presentation, I do want to give a little bit of a shout out to some of the sources that I used for, uh, for this presentation. Um, the, one of the most useful sources, if you're studying the Boer War, is a book called Painting the Map Red, which is backwards on my screen, but uh, which you will uh, uh, see here. It's a very nice book. It's pretty weighty tome. Uh, and it is uh, written by historian Carmen Miller, who also wrote, if you're not wanting to take on such a large volume of history about the Boer War, wrote a book called Canada's Little War, which actually looks like a children's book, but it isn't really. Uh, it's just a really great uh, short history of Canada's involvement uh, in the Boer War. Uh, and then on top of that, I also uh, use significantly a lot of information from this book called, I've got some glare at the battery, which is written by our James Steele uh, with Captain John A. Gill. And it is the history of the 10th Field Battery Royal Canadian Artillery, uh, which was very useful, as well as uh, William Smythe's history of the uh, second dragoons uh, in St. Catharines. And then of course, I can't forget the, uh, the those that gave me some assistance uh, throughout pulling together some information. And most specifically, I wanna shout out to uh, Bob Sears and Dennis Gannon and Bill Stevens, whose uh, previous research has helped me to uh, fill in some of the gaps of some of the information that I'm gonna tell you about uh, this evening. So the question really is why, why should we, why should we want to study the Boer War and what makes it significant to our story in uh, Canada and in St. Catharines? Um, for those who are not familiar with the Boer War, uh, it really marked the first time that Canadian forces engaged in combat operations overseas as a Canadian force. While Canadians had already begun to start to uh, kind of coalesce around an identity after the Boer War, Canada began to really see itself as a distinct country within the British Empire, uh, but still highly aligned with Britain, but really seeking its own uh, independent identity. And so what was Canada in the 19, at the end of the 19th century? What did Canada look like at the end of the 19th century? Uh, Canada as a country in 1900, let's just go with 1900, uh, was searching for identity. There was this constant push-pull, uh, which actually has continued uh, to be constant throughout the 20th century and even into today of, uh, do we align with American ideals in a North American alliance, or do we align with British ideals of uh, imperial solidarity? The Canada of the 1870s and 1880s was a country that was in flux uh, with a population of 5 million, 68% lived in the countryside and the number of people moving to the city was increasing every year. But the industrial revolution was changing the economic reality of the country growth and consolidation of industry and an expansion of service industries were offering men different options for how to make a living. 
as historian Carmen Miller suggests, and I'm quoting, the telephone typewriter and new corporate and administrative structures were transforming urban work in, in ways in which workers often resented, end quote. Additionally, many of these new jobs required training and additional education, which created a shift in the importance of institutions supporting youth development, such as schools, churches, and voluntary organizations, which helped to build skills and make men into productive members of society. So I just wanna clarify uh, when I get to this part of the presentation, because you'll note that I've, I've mostly noted men throughout this presentation so far. And that's really kind of the focus uh, because I'm really talking about those that ended up going to fight overseas uh, and those that were part of the military at the time. And for the most part, they were men. Compulsory and free state-run education. Uh, and schooling was instituted in Ontario in 1871 and soon spread throughout Canada. Families hoped that schooling would provide an avenue for their children to have a better life and to be better citizens. With the encouragement of Christian reform movements, a shift towards creating better citizens on earth with the final goal of a better place after death. Leading a virtuous life and being a good citizen became synonymous. Another offshoot of increased literacy included the influence of the printed word and the growth of ideological trends would have. These we would probably call isms today. These ideologies became much more accessible to a wider, more literate audience. Imperialism and nationalism were some of the most popular of these ideologies at the turn of the 19th century, not just in Canada, but across the world. Canadians who advocated for a Canada as part of a united British empire were encouraged by such activities as drill, demonstrations, patriotic exercises, historical reenactments, which all contributed to this idea of Canada's place in the world order. School curriculum supported these ideas and popular literature encouraged in young men the concepts of manliness, courage, adventure, heroism, and the protection of the weak. Authors such as Richard Kip Kipling and G.A. Henty were incredibly popular proponents of these ideals and would have been readily available to young boys and men of the period. Uh, if you're at all familiar with literature of this period, this was the period where the boys' own book was incredibly popular. Stories of grand adventures and kind of chivalrous activities were very, very popular and were easily accessible to, uh, to most of the population the price to buy magazines with these kinds of stories in them was very, very accessible to, to most people. The church's encouragement of these ideals supported this shift towards empire building. And I'm quoting here from Carmen Miller. In their churches where the flag, the Bible, and the English language seemed as indivisible as the Trinity young men were urged to rid the land of evil and win the world for Christ in their generation. Additionally, the growth of patriotic and recreational organizations who supported the imperial movement provided an outlet for young men who were experiencing social disconnection due to the changing demographics of city versus country living. Organizations such as the Navy League, cadets, the Boys Brigade, Sons of Canada, United Empire Loyalist Associations, the Orange Order, the Anglo-Saxon Union, St. George's Society, Rifle Associations and Militia Units, and more on top of all of this, experienced popularity and growth throughout this period and into the early part of the 20th century. Imperial unity was a popular idea with business owners who saw the benefit of a larger market, expansion of Canada's ability to secure credit, a larger market to sell the benefits of Canada as a permanent home, cross empire postage system, the red route, which is what you can see in this picture here, the cable service between uh, countries that were uh, in the British Empire, and subsidies for improved transoceanic shipping and other international projects that could benefit from the attachment to the largest market in the world at the time. But imperial unity also had its detractors. 
as well, who did not see any benefit to political unity. Canada should make decisions in its own best interest, they would say. Additional, additionally, imperial defense was a contentious issue in Canada. While Canada welcomed British involvement in the defense of the country, they drew the line at increased spending on defense and spending only for domestic defense, not as an imperial force abroad. Canadians were particularly supportive of British support in defending our country against the United States expansionist designs. Interesting thing about imperial defense at the time was that they Canadians generally didn't mind if Britain wanted to pay to have their forces and to defend Canada, but Canadians themselves didn't really want to pay to have a military or a standing army at the time. It was very difficult for most parliaments to vote money for, uh, for defense spending. Additionally, those who supported imperial political unity in Canada frequently saw it as a stepping stone towards a more independent Canada. Imperial unity could act as a kind of security blanket to support the country until we no longer needed it. So hopefully the idea would be that if you're in a, uh, a unified empire and able to take advantage of this large uh, economic block and market that once our country was much more successful, we'd be able to separate ourselves from the empire and be able to kind of step off on our own and not have to worry about uh, potential annexation by the United States, which was a big fear uh, at the time. But the general ideals behind the empire continued to enjoy widespread support from a large portion of the Canadian population who continued to be predominantly of British background. According to Carmen Miller, British ideals provided identity and significance to the disparate, fragile British North American community of the 1880s. An example of how these ideals manifested themselves in the social fabric was through patriotic education. The imperialists convinced the Ontario Minister of Education, George Ross, who himself was also an ardent imperialist, to remove from school textbooks anything un-Canadian and to order that the national flag be flown at all schools in the province. In addition, schools were encouraged to have their students write prose and poetry with patriotic themes of loyalty and praise of country. Included in these ideals were the encouragement of collective values, discipline, and the subordination of self to the common good. Of course, in all of this, an underlying kind of theme that ran th runs through a lot of this patriotic fervor is the, the idea of war and war heroes, which continue to be popular uh, literary and historical topics. Popular liter literature, community celebrations and community organizations also bolstered the idea that war was a nation building experience. From this emerged the militia myth, which many of you may have heard of, which was the belief in the superiority and dependability of the untrained citizen soldier over the disciplined barrack bred British regular. The Canadian version of the militia myth espoused the idea that citizen soldiers had saved the day on numerous occasions in the past when called to do so. The Battle of Queenston Heights, which you can see in this picture, is uh, an excellent uh, example of uh, how this fed into the militia myth. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of the Battle of Queenston Heights in this uh, this fictionalized uh, painting of the battle. Isaac Brock is laying in the foreground with his sword pointed up to the top of Queenston Heights and uh, yelling push on to the York volunteers who are saving, saving the day, essentially. This idea led to the notion that war was the duty of the citizen soldiers. This made war a people's crusade rather than the preserve of skilled professionals. This view of Canada's citizen soldiers was the backbone of the idealism that propped up militia units across English Canada, who hearkened back to their glorious history as they trained and socialized in communities ac across the country. And St. Catharines would have been no different than any of these other, um, other communities that had militias units. 
So we've talked a little bit about the ideological and kind of social context that the the, uh, the Boer War kind of steps into. Uh, but now let's circle back and talk about the war itself and the overall context in Canada. What was the public opinion of this war in the country? The debate over Canadian participation in the Boer War would be one of the most spiteful and controversial of its time. According to Carmen Miller, and I quote, no aspect of the South African War has received greater attention from Canadian historians than this rancorous public controversy. Viewed as a contest of wills between French and English Canadians, historians have seen the pro-war advocates triumph as a political warshed, watershed. In their view, the controversy split open the cleft between English and French Canadians, launched the 20th century French Canadian nationalist movement, broke Laurier's power in Quebec, and served as a dress rehearsal for the First World War." End quote. That's a lot to attribute to a single conflict. Of course, there are nuances of this issue at the time, um, and today, looking back on them, are far more complex than I'm able to even de delve into uh, in this presentation. Um, but essentially, the Boer War represented for Canada the, the birth of a new Canadian nationalism, distinct from British imperialism, but still connected. While many historians have argued that, Canada's, that Canada came of age at Vimy Ridge during the First World War, I would argue that Canada's participation in the Boer War had already developed this nascent sense of Canadian identity, which would grow in strength uh, it, to its peak in the First World War. So how did this war start? I'll give you a little quick background. It's very, it's fairly complicated and convoluted and which is why Carmen Miller wrote uh, a book that is uh, uh, something like 700 pages, 500 pages. So uh, it is a fairly complex um, conflict, but I'll try to uh, take it down. And uh, thanks to the Canadian Encyclopedia, um, according to the Canadian Encyclopedia, Britain went to war in 1899 as the imperial aggressor against two independent Afrikaner or Boer republics. The Afrikaners were descendants of Protestant, Dutch, French, and German refugees who had migrated in the 17th century to the Cape of Good Hope on the southern tip of Africa. After Britain took control of the Cape in the 19th century, many Afrikaners, unwilling to submit to British rule, trekked north to the interior where they established the independent nations of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, which you can see on this map in, uh, in orange right in the center of the, uh, the map. By 1899, the British Empire, then at the height of its power, had two South African colonies, uh, the Cape and Natal basically the green sections on the map, but also wanted, to con wanted control of the neighboring Boer states. Transvaal was the real prize because it was home to the richest gold fields on earth. And then eventually later they find diamonds there as well. Britain's pretext for war was the denial of political rights by the Boers to the growing population of foreigners or Wheatlanders as they were called, as they were known in the Afrikaans language but who were mostly immigrants from Britain and its colonies. They worked the Transvaal gold mines. The British government rallied public sympathy for the Wheatlander cause throughout the empire, including Canada, where parliament passed a resolution of Wheatlander support. So this picture here is a, a picture of a, a group of Boer soldiers. Uh, this picture comes from a photo album that belonged to a local soldier who fought in the Boer War. His name was John Gare, uh, and he brought this photo home with him. I don't believe he took this photo. I think it was a photo he purchased while he was uh, in South Africa and brought it home. Uh, and this was in his photo album. At the height of its power in 1899, Britain viewed the largely agrarian and religiously conservative Boers as backwards looking and an obstacle to larger political and economic ambitions in the region. 
British authorities even hoped for war. Some British authorities even hoped for a war, which they thought they could easily win to resolve the Boer problem once and for all by incorporating them into a pan-British South Africa. This is a typical British and well, lots of time, lots of countries have had this conceit where they figure, you know what, we might as well just start a war because we are much more powerful and we're going to win. Which, you know, doesn't always turn out the way that you hope. On the 9th of October, the Transvaal government issued an ultimatum demanding, oh, sorry, I missed a sentence here. Matters came to a head in 1899 when Britain began reinforcing its military garrison in South Africa. So they brought in troops from abroad uh, and started to garrison uh, the areas around uh, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. In, on, October, on the 9th of October, the Transvaal government issued an ultimatum to the British demanding that the buildup cease. London did not reply basically didn't bother. And on the 11th of October, the Boers declared war. Britain increased pressure on the Boers and moved troops into the region and, until finally in October, uh, the Boer governments made a preemptive military strike against British forces gathering in the nearby Natal. Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier at the time was reluctant to get involved and his divided cabinet was thrown into a crisis on the matter. Uh, if you know anything at all about Wilfrid Laurier's um, time as prime minister, uh, he was always kind of uh, walking this fine line between uh, French and English supporters in Canada and uh, trying to always be the mediator on all sides and to try to make everyone happy, which sometimes came across as uh, difficulty in choosing a side, essentially. Um, but in this case, Wilfrid Laurier understood the ramifications of the government siding one way or the other and really didn't want to get involved, but his cabinet was divided. Canada did not have a professional army at the time, but eventually under intense pressure, the government authorized the recruitment of a token force of 1,000 volunteer infantrymen. Although they would fight within the British Army, it was the first time Canada would send soldiers overseas into battle wearing Canadian uniforms. Imperial presumption and conspiracy theories had complicated a difficult situation for Laurier. He had planned a trip to Chicago just when all of this was happening. And just before he'd left for his planned trip to Chicago in October, 1899, the British colonial secretary, who was Joseph Chamberlain at the time, had sent a generic telegram to all self-governing colonies, thanking them for their generous offer of troops and indicating the organizational form their assistance might take, such as company size and um, infantry units of 25 men that could easily be integrated into British battalions. Somehow, the Deputy Minister of Militia, Colonel L.J. Pino, had inadvertently released the telegram to the press, and it created a furor. As an aside here, the press in Canada at this time was incredibly partisan. Both political parties used the press to their advantage in any situation. In fact, many political parties owned certain uh, presses. And so uh, they used their press to their advantage in this situation to try to influence the government in one direction or the other. And this is a great example of that. So the government asked who had offered these troops and by what authority? Was it the Canadian government, the governor general, the general officer commanding the Canadian militia? Or was this some sort of ploy to force the Canadian government's hands? Laurier Dean denied that Canada was going to send troops. He said, a right off, that's it, we're not sending them. But no sooner had he done so that the Military Gazette, which was a very prominent journal at the time, which had in its confidence the general officer commanding, Major General E.T.H. Hutton, who you can see here, the Military Gazette printed a story contradicting the Prime Minister. The Gazette informed the public that indeed the government had plans to send an official contingent of some 1,200 men composed of infantry, cavalry, and artillery. 
Technically, this information was correct. During the past summer, a plan had been devised with the knowledge and consent of the Minister of Militia on the expectation that a war could happen, so why not be prepared? The plan's existence had been conveyed to the British War Office by the Governor General, Lord Minto, who stuck his nose into this whole affair, and who also happened to be a close personal friend of the GOC, Major General Hutton. This all looked like an orchestrated attempt to get the government to send troops. When it was all investigated, evidence seemed to point to Minto and Hutton being implicated in this ruse. The government debated the contribution that Canada would put forward, and after two days of lengthy debate, the final decision was to equip 1,000 infantry volunteers divided into eight companies of 125 men each. They would be transported, paid, maintained, and returned to Canada at British expense. Canada would foot the bill for the cost to recruit the troops. But most importantly, what Laurier really wanted to make sure was a part of this decision was that this would not be construed as setting a precedent for future colonial action. Laurier was very uh, adamant that the Canadian government not get entangled in colonial affairs or be expected to be participating in colonial wars across the world. The force was to number 1,000 with each recruit agreeing to one year's service. There were so many volunteers that a selection process based on health, marksmanship, and prior military service was instituted. Despite the war's unpopularity within French Canada, though, F Company's soldiers were all Francophones from Quebec, New Brunswick, and Ontario, with half its non-commissioned officers and officers also French speaking. The battalion was organized into eight 125 man regionally based companies with one from Western Canada, three from Ontario and two each from Quebec and the Maritimes, including the Francophone conglomerate. 70% of those selected were Canadian born and most of the others were from Britain. The commander of the Canadian forces would be Lieutenant Colonel William Otter who had distinguished himself during the Northwest Rebellion. Well, we mostly refer to that now as the Northwest Resistance. The contingent also included chaplains, four newspaper correspondents. This is the first contingent we're talking about here. A YMCA representative, a Red Cross officer, although they were not technically attached to the first contingent. They also sent a full field hospital, including four nurses, which went out with the first contingent. By the end of the war, 7,368 Canadian men volunteered to fight in South Africa. Of these, 230 died, uh, and a fairly large portion of those died from disease. So we've spent a long time now, almost a half an hour, uh, setting the context uh, for this uh, conflict and uh, what was going on in Canada at the time. But now let's talk a little bit more specifically about St. Catharines and its participation in the war. St. Catharines in 1900 was a bustling community with a population of approximately 10,000 people. The community, not surprisingly, you, this will not come as a shock to anyone. The community had a compact urban center focused on the downtown with farmland occupying the periphery within close travel distance. According to the 1900 report of the Board of Trade, 1900 was the most prosperous year the city had experienced in a quarter of a century. According to John Jackson and Sheila Wilson in their book, St. Catharines, Canada's Canal City, uh, and I'm quoting here, the town had a distinct physical identity and social continuity with shopkeepers running the family business that had been started 10 or 30 years ago. People knew one another, their families, their strengths and weaknesses and their foibles. Life was neither drab nor uninteresting for there were churches with their social events, sports, clubs and society, as well as other entertainment. 
The city had seen significant growth in the second half of the 19th century, having grown from a population of 6,284 in 1860 to approximately 10,000 in 1900. The ethnic makeup of the population was predominantly British, uh, which included English, Irish, and Scottish, uh, which you can see this chart is from uh, the Jackson and Wilson book. And uh, you can see the uh, the third from the left is the uh, uh, the 1901 census uh, ethnic diversity of the uh, the population. The city boasted three military units in 1899, the 2nd 10th Dragoons, the 7th St. Catherine's Artillery, and the 19th St. Catherine's Battalion of Infantry, as they were called in 1897, uh, which became the 19th St. Catherine's Regiment in May 1900. Overall, Canada's forces consisted of permanent active militia and non-permanent active militia. Local units were a part of Canada's non-permanent active militia, which was made up of small units across the country, consisting mainly of part-time soldiers employed in uh, the civilian world who additionally did military training on evenings, weekends, and for short periods in the summer months. In fact, local units had only recently participated in a summer training camp in Niagara in June and July of 1899. So I'm going to uh, just give a little uh, kind of explanation a little bit about some of the images in this uh, slideshow. So they are all from the, uh, the era that we are talking about tonight, which is 1899 to 1902. Uh, but interestingly enough, we don't have very many photos of the actual contingent that went overseas uh, for the Boer War. We do have some images of some of the different training camps, which this is one of them. Uh, this particular picture is a group training in Niagara Falls. Uh, I believe it's in 1898, uh, but it's very similar to what would have occurred uh, in 1899 and in 1900 as well. So the war is declared, which we already heard about. But none of the local units as part of the non-permanent active militia were asked to send soldiers as part of the first contingent of uh, soldiers in South Africa, mainly because they were recruiting from the permanent uh, militia units. So let's talk a little further about the three local military units and a little bit about their history. Uh, so starting with the 2nd 10th Dragoons, the 2nd Regiment of Cavalry was established on May 1st, 1872 as a Hussar Regiment with eight troops of cavalry. Uh, number one troop was based in St. Catharines. The regiment transformed to dra Dragoon format in 1887. Uh, and regimental headquarters of the unit was moved to St. Catharines in 1892. When the second draft for the Boer War was called for, the second 10th Dragoons provided a volunteer draft of 16 personnel, which included one officer and 15 other ranks. And these served with the Canadian Mounted Rifles during the war. This photo is actually a photo of the Canadian Mounted Rifles. Uh, we have no photos in our collection of the 2nd 10th Dragoons, <laughs> which would have been really awesome to have, uh, but sadly we don't have specifically uh, a photo like this. So our unit went over and joined the, uh, the 1st Canadian Mounted Rifles. The Department of Militia was looking for, and the quote was for men who could ride and shoot. So cavalry troops were the primary target to fill out a second contingent that was called for by the end of 1899. According to the history of the second 10th Dragoons written by William Smy, and I quote, the seemingly small quotas permitted for each regiment were quickly made up and many cavalry, cavalry men were again disappointed. As noted, this unit joined the 1st Canadian Mounted Rifles in action and participated in some of the harshest campaigning of the war. Two of their members died during the conflict, including Lieutenant J.E. Birch and Trooper A. Radcliffe. Major General Hutton 
commander of the Canadian troops in South Africa, said the following in a dispatch of July 1st, 1900, about Lieutenant Birch's death. And this is a quote from his, uh, his dispatch. Lieutenant Borden and Birch, first CMR, were killed yesterday while gallantly leading their Canadians in a counterattack upon the enemy's flank at a critical juncture of their assault upon our position at Whitport. Lieutenant Birch was 26 years of age and the son of Major F.O. Birch Sr. Lieutenant Borden was the only son of the Minister of Militia, Sir Frederick Borden. The two men were buried nearby at Richtflay. We don't have a lot of information about Private Radcliffe. We have a little bit, which I will share in a little while. But what we do know is that Private Radcliffe, what we know of Private Radcliffe was that he was killed in action at Boschport near Belfast on September 30th, 1900 and was buried there. The 19th St. Catharines Regiment did not send any troops overseas during the war. Essentially, they were not. Mainly, this was due to the fact that the military establishment was not looking for infantry soldiers from the non-permanent active militia in either the first or the second contingents. They did participate in all of the parades to see these soldiers of both the 2nd, 10th and the 7th uh, off. And they, uh, of course, their military band played at uh, those uh, the celebration to see off the soldiers and the celebrations when they returned. In December 1899, the government called for a second contingent of soldiers and a brigade of three six-gun batteries was also requested. The artillery unit would consist of C, D, and E batteries, each equipped with six 12-pound breech-loading guns. One section of each of these batteries would be formed from the Royal Canadian Artillery Permanent Force, and the remaining personnel would come from the militia units. On the 27th of December, 1899, Major Merritt, commander of the 7th Battery, received the news all had been waiting for. And here's the quote from the telegram. Want men for 2nd Contingent, C Battery, Kingston, Gananoque, Winnipeg, St. Catharines, Toronto. Men will be enrolled for each section allotted. Each section will represent batteries which have furnished their quota. The qualifications, height, Gunners, five foot six, 34 inch chest. Drivers, five foot three, 33 inch chest. Age, not less than 22 and no older than 40 years old. To have performed at least one annual training as a field battery man in the active militia or have served in the Royal Canadian Artillery. Volunteer drivers, other than Royal Canadian Artillery, are asked to offer their own horses. After valuation, a fair price would be offered. Horse becomes property of the government. In this original ask, 7th Battery was asked to provide 18 men. The St. Catharines Daily Standard noted that quite a number of the battery boys assembled at their quarters on Tuesday night, and from now until the complement is complete, the gun shed will be open every evening for the purpose of enlisting those desirous of going to the front to fight for queen and empire. A few days later, the quota was revised to one officer and 25 other ranks. And by the end of, you notice that the telegram was sent on the 27th of December. By the end of December, the entire quota was met. Lieutenant W.B. King would lead the 7th Battery contingent. Mayor Keating and Council talked about plans for a grand send-off for the men of both units going overseas. According to the St. Catharines Standard, Major Merritt suggested, and I quote, some gift should be presented, but more of a memento rather than anything of great value when on active service. The battery was scheduled to leave for Kingston on January 2nd, 1900, with their time of leaving postponed to the afternoon in order to allow the citizens of St. Catharines and other social groups to provide an appropriate send off. The night before, on January 1st in the evening, a meeting was held at the Opera House on Ontario Street. The South African contingent 
with both the Dragoons and the Seventh Battery men, was presented on stage to a packed house. There were the usual speeches, including one by Lieutenant King and Marshall Music, likely played by the 19th Regimental Band, and presentations. Sergeant Harry Hall received a gold ring on behalf of the sergeant's mess, and driver Parnell was given a neat sum of money. In his speech, Lieutenant King noted, and I quote, they were going to do battle for the one great flag. And so on Tuesday, January 2nd, the local citizens lined the streets and the storefronts were hung with, with bunting and patriotic colors. The St. Catherine's Daily Standard said the following about the parade. Before the parade formed up, the crowds caught sight of the second dragoons and a great cheer went up. The paper went on to say, the cavalry boys were the object of great admiration until Lieutenant King appeared with his detachment of artillery men. Then cheer after cheer went up and attention was divided between the dragoons and those of the big guns. The parade to the train station was led off by the mayor and council in carriages. Then the 19th Battalion Band played British Grenadiers. Then followed veterans of the Fenian campaign. The rest of 7th Battery men left behind. Firefighters of the Citizens Hose Company. And this uh, ribbon that you see in this photo is actually one of the uh, ribbons that was provided by the Citizens Hose Company for that parade, uh, which is also a part of the John Garrett collection uh, at the museum. Uh, and assumedly he was given this ribbon to wear uh, by the Citizens Hose Company in the parade. So firefighters of the Citizens Hose Company and the Andrew Riddell Hook and Ladder Company and Neptun Neptune's Hose Company also in the parade was the Prince of Orange Lodge LBT Loyal True Blue Number no. 3 and employees of McLaren and Company. After all of these had paraded past the spectators, they joined the parade to make their way to the train station. At the station, the mayor made a speech and each soldier was presented with an envelope of money. Sadly, there is no record of what each soldier received but it is known that they raised $1,100 a couple of days prior to embarking. So it's likely that they raised, a, that each soldier received around $25 each. Uh, and so I was interested in what this might mean in today's dollars. So while inflation calculators are not necessarily very accurate, uh, I thought it would be a fun bit of information. And according to the Bank of Canada inflation calculator, uh, which really only started calculating in 1914, um, $25 in 1914 would have been worth $530. Uh, so that's a pretty neat and tidy sum, I would say. Also, according to uh, Private John Gare, who was a, a driver in the 7th Battery, uh, the city also paid for a life insurance policy for the men. Uh, we are lucky in the museum to have John Gare's diaries in our collection. Uh, I think it's four or five uh, small books that he kept basically from the time he signed up to his return to, uh, to Canada. And he writes in his diary on February 7th, as the battery men were training in Kingston, evening went before and passed a doctor to get insurance in Foresters for $1,000 paid for by the city of St. Catharines. Good for them. So not only did the city of St. Catharines provide a monetary contribution to the men going overseas, they also provide a life insurance policy for them should something happen. The soldiers arrived in Kingston uh, the next day after leaving St. Catharines and the seventh battery men became part of C battery and left for Halifax on the 15th of February. C battery was unfortunately held up in Halifax for a few weeks due to illness on the transport ship they were scheduled uh, to embark and left Halifax on the 21st of February, 1900 on the SS Milwaukee. So there don't seem to be any pictures around of that particular embarkation, but this picture that you see here is the embarkation of the first contingent who went out uh, to South Africa and assumedly the second contingent's uh, trip overseas looked very similar. Uh, John Gare notes that there were um, 
uh, many people, spectators in attendance, there were bands and speeches as well when they left uh, Halifax to go to South Africa. So the trip over to South Africa. Along the way, they ran into a heavy storm on the third day at sea, and Gunner Shirley Newton wrote proudly to his sister, uh, which was quoted in the newspaper, only Black O'Neill, Irwin, and myself had not been sick. John Gare in his diary also notes of the same storm three days out. And he says, and I quote, a southerly gale, quite a heavy sea, nearly all sick. Put on mess orderly, no assistance, all turned sick, very few for meals. Got under difficulties, horses having a hard time, rain all night and lightning. As they reached warmer climes, wind sails were rigged on the ships to make things more comfortable for the men and animals aboard, especially the horses. John Gare, who was responsible for the care of the horses on the trip, makes many notes in his diary about the state of the horses on the trip over. For example, on March 4th, he noted the following in his diary. Fine morning, Good southwest breeze, sea calm, divine service at 10 a.m., issued with four apples apiece and figs today for dinner. Called away from dinner to stables to help put out another horse. Had just retired from the same duty. Up to today, the battery had not lost a horse, but today we lost four. And the RCAs, Royal Canadian Artillery one, five in all. Attended prayer meeting tonight. So this photo, um, which clearly is not on a ship <laughs> heading over to South Africa, is actually a photo that is part of the John Gare photo album collection. Uh, so he did take or had someone in his unit took photos while they were in South Africa, which is quite a rare collection to have. We're very lucky to have this collection. The photos are not amazing. So you see that the quality of the photo is difficult to see, but I thought it would be really important for these to be shown as part of this presentation uh, because they really do show the local uh, participation in the war. And this particular picture is from when um, the battery men and their horses uh, had just arrived in South Africa and they were disembarking and getting their unit prepared to move. So overall, the battery would lose 14 horses en route to South Africa which they reached on the 14th of March. The crossing had taken a month and then they waited for four days on the ship in the harbor to disembark. The seventh battery men and really all the soldiers in South Africa spent a significant amount of their time moving from place to place. Like many soldiers, you spend a lot of time marching from place to place. John Gare took the time in his diary to note all the places and distances they traveled while in South Africa, which include uh, travel by rail, horse, and on foot, nearly 9,000 miles, and then another 2,000 miles on return travel to their embarkation point in Cape Town to return to Canada. This photo, which is also in uh, Gare's photo album, uh, shows men from the unit traveling by stagecoach, uh, which was another popular form of travel uh, for those who were able to, uh, to take advantage of it uh, at the time. But they do talk, uh, he does talk about traveling by rail, he talks about marching, he talks about riding. So there were many different ways to get around, but traveling 9,000 miles uh, was a significant distance uh, for less than a year in the country. Sea Battery spent a large portion of their time assisting and gardening, guarding railway repair crews, which was an increasingly important task as the Boers had taken to targeting the rail routes the British were using to move their troops. This is another photo from the from John Gare's photo album, which shows some men from the, uh, the battery um, sitting around and you can see they have a pet. There's actually a couple photos in the album of different uh, different pets, a couple of dogs uh, and a monkey uh, at one point, which I'm not, I actually don't show as part of this presentation, but it's in the, uh, the photo album.
So C Battery also participated in many skirmishes and actions throughout the war, uh, but I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time detailing out every single action of the battery. Uh, if you're interested in um, hearing a blow by blow of all of the um, where the Canadian soldiers were and all of the actions during the South African War, I highly recommend uh, Carmen Miller's book. Uh, for that. It's a very readable um, example of uh, a really interesting military history that Canadians participated in. Uh, and if you just want to hear about where the uh, the Sea Battery men were, I recommend uh, James Steele's book, uh, the section about the Boer War, which is a small chapter um, and has a very fairly detailed account of where those men were throughout the war. By the end of the summer in 1900, the battery had marched around the country and back and forth in unpleasant conditions with increasingly stretched support lines. Uh, the Boer War was really an unpleasant uh, conflict to participate in because the British had really underestimated how many supplies they were going to need, their ability to resupply, and how much food and water the soldiers would require for marching around in sandy, dry soil. Uh, and so it was unpleasant for soldiers because they just were provided with, you know, half rations, uh, they had difficulty finding clothing, uh, and then there were um, disorganized transport lines, which saw at times their equipment lost. So they end up sleeping outside without tents. There's all kinds of examples of this. And so um, it was not a pleasant conflict, not that conflict is pleasant anyway, but it wasn't a pleasant uh, conditions to be um, fighting within. Lieutenant King actually wrote from just outside Cape Town uh, to his family, and his letter was reprinted in the Standard on August 30th, 1900. And he says, uh, and I quote, in this miserable place, there is no water nearer than four miles and not a tree in sight. When I first arrived here, I had a gun emplacement built and have since made a dugout for myself on the outside trench covered with some sheet iron, hotter than the blazes and the flies are awful, end quote. By October 1900, the battery's term was coming to an end, and men were looking to return to Canada. They were offered the option to stay longer uh, if they wished, but for the most part, most Canadians did not wish to do so. Uh, of the group, only Lieutenant King and Sergeant Jameson Black decided to stay on. Lieutenant King joined the South African Constabulary, uh, which had the popular uh, extra pay, which paid 450 pounds sterling, and chose to hone his military skills, according to, uh, to James Steele in his book. Shirley Newton, one of, of King's men, had written home to his family in September 1900 about Lieutenant King, and he said, Willie King is making a man of himself. He's getting on all right. By October 14th, the men of C and D battery were encamped at the convalescent camp near Pretoria. At the time, driver Stokes of the group noted, they are a tough looking lot, not two of them dressed alike. Everyone has different clothes, any old thing they could beg, borrow or steal. Still, they feel as tough as they look. This picture and the last one that you saw uh, are both uh, pictures, again, from John Garrett's diary. The, the one that I showed earlier, this one is men at their canteen uh, getting uh, water and food. And then this one is men doing their laundry uh, uh, in near Pretoria, I believe. So the men had been convalescing on October 14th, but by the time December rolls around, the men embarked, they'd had to travel from one from there to Cape Town to embark. So the men embarked in Cape Town on December 13th, 1900, leaving King and Black behind. They returned to St. Catharines in January, 1901, again to storefronts decorated with bunting and boisterous crowds. As an aside here, I just wanted to say that we 
if I, I think I mentioned it earlier, but I'm going to mention again, we have no photos of these parades, uh, oddly enough. If you ever happen to come across any, if you have seen them or seen any in any of your travels, those people out there who are uh, history buffs, I'd love to uh, to hear or see any photos you might have seen of either of these two parades, which seem to have come through history with no photographic record. According to Steele, upon their return, Oh, I, I did find this photo, which is actually a photo of the Boer War soldiers returning to Toronto. So I'm just imagining that this is like downtown St. Catharines, covered in bunting with boisterous crowds. So let's imagine that as we hear about what J our James Steele has to say about the soldiers and their return. According to Steele, upon their return, the Cherry Street gunshed rang with stories of daring do or ribald active service stories. And that's a, that was a quote. Later, a service of Thanksgiving would be held for Thanksgiving and to celebrate the peace which happened uh, in, eight, in 1902, on June 8th, 1902. The, the uh, service happened on June 8th, 1902. For 7th Battery, not a man was lost during their, their deployment. Shirley Newton, who we heard about earlier, had actually been wounded. Uh, he shot himself in the leg by accident when jumping up onto a cart or something like that. Um, and some men had succumbed to sickness and disease, but none had been killed in action, uh, technically as part of the 7th Battery group. Jameson Black would later be wounded in action at Hellebron while serving with the Canadian Scouts and died at Kroonstadt on September 5th, 1901. Lieutenant King, who had stayed on in South Africa in 1906, would go on to command a number of units after the war and would take a number of prominent command assignments across the province. There are three local memorials to soldiers killed in action in South Africa. There's the plaque located at the Lake Street Armory, which you can see here in this, uh, this slide. Uh, there's also a plaque located on the side of the private Watson Memorial that's located on the front line of City Hall. And there's a marble relief to Major H.M. Arnold, which is located at St. George's Church. Of the two bronze plaques, the one at the Lake Street Armory notes five men who lost their lives in the Boer War. So we're going to go with this list. Uh, the list on the side of the Private Watson Memorial has four men. Uh, it doesn't list all five. So we're going to start with this list. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about each of these men. So Lieutenant Edgar, John Edgar Birch, who we've already uh, mentioned, was an was the adjutant of the Second Dragoons and was attached to the 1st Battalion Canadian Mounted Rifles. At the time of his death, John Reeves, colonel commanding the Royal Irish Fusiliers, wrote the following, and I want to thank uh, Bill Stevens for this information, uh, which he compiled in one of the Historical Society newsletters uh, a few years back. And this is a quote from John Reeves, colonel of the Royal Irish Fusiliers. In the few words I spoke to you, and this is to Colonel Lassard last night, of the funeral of your two very gallant officers, I am afraid I failed to convey the deep gratitude my regiment owes to the 1st Canadian Mounted Rifles for their gallantry in going so nobly and fearlessly to the succor of our beleaguered detachment at Whitport yesterday. The counterattack your regiment made occurred at a most critical moment and doubtless saved many lives, many of the lives of our detachment. On our return from outpost duty on Tuesday night, we buried two officers by lantern light. All Canadians, 1st and 2nd Battalions, were there. As the two gallant lads lay there with the Canadian flag, which I picked up at Johannesburg, covered their bodies and their Canadian comrades all about them. It was sad and most impressive scene, and I think all our hearts were turned towards the sorrowing one in the dear old land we had left a few months ago. Private Archibald Radcliffe was also killed in action at Wonder Fontaine on September 21st, 1900. He was 21 years old and was killed when Boer soldiers lured him and three other dragoons into a trap, killing two of them as they fought their way out. He was fighting as a part of the Royal Canadian Regiment and was part of the second contingent that went overseas. 
Private Henry Higgins had signed up as part of the last contingent requested by the government in 1901. Eventually, the Canadian government would request a third, fourth, and a fifth contingent. These soldiers sailed for South Africa on the SS Sestrian and sadly found out when they arrived that peace had been declared. Private Higgins was not to know any of this, however, as he contracted pneumonia while at sea and was buried on buried at sea on May 19, 1901. Corporal Robert Irwin of the 19th St. Catharines Regiment had enlisted as part of the Royal Canadian Regiment and was the son of Robert Irwin of St. Catharines. He was wounded in action at Hutuk on May 1st, 1900, uh, and then returned to action, uh, but later died of enteric fever on July 1st, 1900 in Bloemfontein. He was 19 years old. Major Harry M. Arnold, whose marble relief is found in St. George's Church, was a member of the 90th Winnipeg Rifles. He was a member of the Royal Canadian Regiment of Artillery, or sorry, Royal Canadian Regiment of Infantry, 2nd Battalion, and had gone over to South Africa as part of the 1st Contingent. He was shot in the head on February 18, 1900 at Pardberg, as he raised himself to scan the battlefield with his binoculars. He was the son of Charles Morgan Arnold and was 40 years old at the time of his death. The men from all across Canada who returned from South Africa would make up the core of the military forces that would train in the first decade of the 20th century, and many would take part in the Great War when it broke out in 1914. Soldiers who participated in the Boer War would receive the Queen's South African Medal with bars, denoting the relief of Mafeking, Cape Colony, Transvaal, and Orange Free State, or Rhodesia. This medal you see here belonged to John Gare and is currently on display at the museum. Uh, it's probably going to be on display for another couple more weeks, along with a couple of the volumes from his diary. So what is the legacy of the war? The war ended on the 31st of May, 1902. It went on for a significant amount of time after the Canadian soldiers returned to Canada. Uh, it was a, a unpleasant and uh, the war really degenerated into some pretty awful uh, situations, including concentration camps, forced labor uh, and imprisonment of civilians. And many civilians died uh, as part of the, uh, the end kind of phase of the Boer War. Uh, so if you're interested, I highly encourage you to, uh, to read a bit more about uh, that part of Boer War. The overall, the war claimed at least 60,000 lives in total, which included 70, or sorry, 7,000 Boer soldiers and 22,000 Imperial troops, of whom 270 were Canadian. Most of the suffering, however, was borne by civilians, largely due to disease resulting from poor living conditions among the tens of thousands of families confined in British concentration camps. An estimated 7,000 to 12,000 Black Africans died in the camps, along with 18,000 to 28,000 Boers, uh, the majority of them children. Despite the loss of life, at home Canadians viewed their soldiers' military feats with pride and marked their victories during the war with, during the war with massive parades and demonstrations. The war was prophetic in many ways, foreshadowing what was to come in the First World War. The success of Canada's soldiers in South Africa and their criticism of British leadership and social values fed a new sense of Canadian self-confidence, which loosened rather than cemented the ties of empire. The war also damaged relations between French and English Canadians, setting the stage for the larger crisis over conscription, which would consume the country in 1914 to 18. South Africa also introduced new forms of warfare that would loom large in the future, and it showed for the first time the defensive advantage of well-entrenched soldiers armed with long-range rifles and gave the world a foretaste of guerrilla tactics. This picture, this is my last slide for the evening, is a photo on the left is the unveiling of this monument, which is the, uh, the Boer War monument. And you may recognize <laughs> this monument, it's in Toronto um, and uh, located along uh, just on your way up towards Queens Park. 
in uh, that section of road. And uh, it was um, designed and built by Roger Allward, who also built the Vimy Memorial uh, later on after the First World War. Um, so on the left is the unveiling and on the right is a postcard of, uh, of that memorial. As I noted, we don't have a Boer War Memorial itself, like a cenotaph or anything like that in St. Catharines, uh, other than the, uh, the plaques that I mentioned earlier. So thank you very much for joining me for my uh, presentation. Um, I hope you enjoyed this little taste of the Boer War and St. Catharines. Uh, and I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions if you have any. <laughs> Oh, Kathy, thank you so, so much for such an, a really insightful presentation. If, uh, if anyone has any questions about tonight's presentation, uh, please post them in the chat box uh, to the right hand side of your screen and we will get to them. If you're using a tablet or a smartphone, again, you might not be able to see the chat box. So please put your comments or your questions in the comment section. Um, while we wait for more questions, um, again, thank you to our viewers for attending tonight's lecture. And thank you again to Kathy. Um, we really, really appreciate the support of our viewers um, for, throughout the whole season of this uh, virtual museum lecture series. And if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please do consider making a donation to the museum so we can continue to deliver the high quality of programming you do expect from us. Um, again, if you'd like to make a donation, we do have the information to call us or email us um, on, on the presentation screen here. Also, we have many, many lectures for you to watch. And if you haven't watched all of them already, you are welcome to check out uh, the playlist of lectures on our YouTube channel. And please share this playlist with your friends and family. I think we're up to like 19 or 20 lectures now since April so, um, of last year. So that's really exciting for us. Um, also, we would like to remind everyone to please like, follow or subscribe on our social media channels, including here on YouTube to stay in the loop with all of our virtual uh, programming. And also please share the museum in your own social networks so that we can you know, have more of our community join our historical adventures. And if you love a deep dive nature of the lecture series, uh, you are welcome to also try our podcast. We have two, Museum Chat Live, and one hour in the past. And you can all you can catch these podcasts on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Okay, thank you for, uh, for listening to all of this. And I'd like us to get to, to questions and comments. So let me go through them here for you, Kathy. Um, lots and lots of thank yous. So that's always, always great to hear. Uh, we do have one from uh, Robert, Sears, Robert Sears, sorry, he, um, he asked this kind of at the beginning, he asked if there are any library records that show what boys books were popular. Do you have an idea? There are some. Um, the best place to find that information seems to be to be able to find it on um, in uh, publications related to uh, maybe what was available from different publishers for booksellers. And uh, sometimes they, the other place I was able to find a list like that was in school curriculum lists. So the Ontario school curriculum had lists of what books were appropriate. So that is another place I was able to find uh, some of those things. Uh, and then, of course, historians, some of them have started to pull together a few lists, uh, but the list isn't exhaustive, and unfortunately, some of them don't survive. Um, so it's really hard to tell what was available to local people uh, at the time, unless it was specifically noted in somebody's diary or if a book survived in their collection and they donated it to us or a magazine. Uh, but uh, um, the best place I've found was really to find it on the, the book curriculum list for schools. 
That sounds like a very intriguing rabbit hole to go down. Thank you. It is. It's a great question, though. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Bob, for that. Yes. Thank you. Um, There's also a a comment from um, user K Holden. They share an interesting story. They say, my great uncle's nephew-in-law was a Métis soldier, one of only 30 First Nations soldiers to serve in the war. He was five years old when the British militia attacked his home at Batash in 1885. I believe that's in Saskatchewan. Um, Lord Minto was General Middleton's chief of staff at Batash. His wife, Lady Mary Caroline Gray, was the third cousin four times removed of my great uncle whose sister lived in St. Catharines. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, I, I thought that was really fascinating and, and to show um, how this is, the histories are all interconnected, right? With our own colonial histories here in Canada connect to this colonial war overseas as well. I found that really interesting. And thank you to Kay Holden for sharing that. Yeah, what a great family history. I hope uh, I hope you're writing that down and uh, uh, making sure that uh, that that history gets saved to the for the next generation as well. Yes, yes. I hope you are, uh, Kay Holden. Yes. Um, oh, he. They also asked another question. He, they ask uh, the the William King you mentioned. Yeah. Is this William Birchall Macaulay King from Port Colborne? Yes. Yes. yes, that is the same. One okay. and the same. Uh, he was born in Port Colborne in 1878, uh, but was educated in St. Catharines at the Collegiate Institute and joined the Welland Canal Field Battery as a trumpeter in 1889. Um, and then in 1885, he was appointed second lieutenant and then uh, was the lieutenant of Sea Battery uh, during the Boer War. Um, and then, as we heard, he joined the South African Constabulary, Constabulary and served there until 1906. He actually stayed in South Africa after the war. Uh, and then in 1914, he became a major general. And in 1917, he was made a brigadier general and was given the command of the 4th Canadian Division Artillery. Uh, and then in 1922, he was made general officer commanding Military District Number 1 in London, Ontario. Uh, and in 1926, he was given the command of the district number four in Montreal, uh, and then later had retired in 1930. So he had a long and distinguished military career after this. Uh, and also we have pictures in the St. Catherine Standard Collection from the Second World War era, where he is um, obviously retired from his military duties, but his son is in um the uh, uh, the battery at the time. I think it was the battery that his son was a part of uh, in these photos, but his son was a military person training at the same time. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, Kay, Kay Holden again responded saying that I think they have a lot more they want, they'd like to chat with you about, so they might send you an email. <laughs> oh, that would be great. That would be awesome. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> and so many people here are thanking you for the insight and the in-depth research and the detail and putting it together so succinctly. And I really appreciate that too. I think it's an interesting conflict. You and I, Sarah, were talking about this earlier and that it's almost like a hole in our military history. We, as a a community and as a country, really don't know a whole lot about this conflict that had a a major part in how we ended up uh, participating in the First World War. Uh, So I really got interested in it because of the research I did for the First World War (laughs) and then kind of got sucked into this uh, like you said, a rabbit hole of history f- about the Boer War. <laughs> and, and speaking to that, I, I think it's amazing that we have a source like John Gare's diary and the photographs that he was able to keep with them. So I wanted to ask um, of you, like, what was it like to kind of immerse yourself in these sources that he was, the, the, the diary seemed quite diligent and quite descriptive. Like, what was it like to go through that source? Um, it's an interesting source uh, because he keeps good re- like it was it's not like really in depth he never really talks about his emotions or 
uh, family or anything like that, but it does give you a pretty good day by day account of what life would have been like for a soldier like him. And so you kind of get an idea because he always talks about going on to guard duty, then having to do mess duty and then having to, uh, he was a clerk a lot of the time. So doing his clerk's duty and then him talking about the horses, it's just like heartbreaking to hear about the horses being sick and having to throw horses overboard. And so you do get a kind of a, a really interesting view of the kind of day by day, day by day tedium of military service. <laughs> so there is a lot of kind of waiting around and uh, tediousness to military service. So there's like lots of waiting around and then like really, really scary stuff and then lots of waiting around again. And uh, you do get a lot of that feel for reading from reading that source. An uh, interesting thing about his diary is it's really small. Like some of them are only like just little small booklets like that you could fit in your little pot in your pocket. And he wrote in tiny, tiny writing from the very top corner all the way across the page right to the bottom. So it's just packed full. He would actually make a great museum cataloger because his handwriting was tiny, but it was relatively easy to read. <laughs> and so, uh, so it was a really interesting, uh, interesting source. And I mean, it's a great source uh, from this period, which we don't have a lot of in Canadian history at all of diaries from entire conflicts. Well, yeah, that's just it. The fact that we have, you know, such an in-depth first person perspective of the whole journey from the time he left, like that, that's what an incredibly rich source and we are really lucky. And I think it really provided great insight for what it was like for the soldiers of St. Catharines to, to fight in this war that like you say, we. We don't really know a lot of, about and even the comments that, that I'm seeing a lot of them a lot of our viewers tonight are like I only knew about the name I didn't really know much about the war at all and I think it's just not in our national collective narrative the way that you know the first world war is for example Do well because any... the first world war was such a, a life changing like a world changing uh, act at the time it basically like I I would say it sucked all the oxygen out of the air for what had come before it was like nothing that came before could compare to what happened in the first world war and the enormity of the loss and that because it had been not that long before that it's almost like it was lost in that uh, kind of remembrance of the first world war and of course remembrances weren't very popular uh, so building big, huge cenotaphs didn't become popular till after the First World War. And so it wasn't really very common to see cenotaphs in every community for uh, the conflicts like the uh, the Boer War or the Fenian Raids, for example, or something like that for those communities that participated the War of 1812. Th there weren't memorials in every community. So if you don't see it, you forget about it. And then it just it just gets lost in public consciousness. That's a really interesting story about public commemoration. And yeah, if we don't have the physical thing to help us remember, then we forget that that could be another lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one uh, question from Elizabeth Frazier. Um, it's a bit specific. Um, where was the city park that they celebrated the Thanksgiving event? It was at Montebello Park. I believe. I think pretty much any time they say city park in downtown, I think they mean Montebello Park. Um, only because I came across another uh, bit of information, uh, thanks to Dennis Gannon, who found some info in a newspaper about um, a celebration. Oh, sorry, it was in the Ridley newsletter. They were talking about uh, a play that the Ridley students had gone to. And during the play, this uh, this information had been passed to the audience of a great victory in South Africa. There was grand rejoicing. And this was at the Opera House, which is right on Ontario Street, was right at on, on Ontario Street, not far from Montebello Park. And so they talk about in this newsletter that the um, the men from the battery went to the gun shed, pulled out a gun from the battery and dragged it to the park. They only say the park, dragged it to the park and fired off a 21 gun salute. But based on the proximity, <laughs> the only park they could really be talking about is Montebello Park. And so if, in my mind, that I think I would say 95% sure that they're talking about Montebello Park here. 
I think that's a really fair assessment, especially given the, the context that you just, uh, that source that you just read. A uh, great, great question. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you to everyone for all of your great, great questions. And thank you to Kathy again for such a really insightful presentation on the Boer War and for helping us understand a little bit more about its impact in Canada, the context, St. Catherine's involvement. I mean, we really, really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Awesome. All right. Have a super wonderful night, everyone. And we will see you again on March 30th for our next virtual lecture. Bye, everyone. Bye.